My next guest is a native Johannesburger, but spent a large part of her life in Mozambique, where she worked for LM Radio, and uh, became a household name in South Africa. She has worked on Springbok Radio, and more recently, for Radio Highfelt. She says that she is a television addict, but she's terrified of being in front of the cameras. She doesn't have to be. Please welcome Auntie Evie Martin. <laughs> Evie Martin, welcome to Late Night Live. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here. Thanks for inviting me. No, it's a pleasure. It's the first time we've met, actually. Yes. Famous name like you, too. <laughs> now, you, you were born in Johannesburg, but you moved to Mozambique and spent yes. a great deal of your time there. What made you move to Mozambique? My husband. Your husband. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, we used to go to, my family and I, we used to go to Mozambique to burn some marks for holidays about twice a year or whatever. And when I was 18, I met Arthur. Arthur's your husband? That's right. Right. And um, we didn't get married straight away. Well, what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> I let him wait three years. And then we got married. And, of course, I had to go and live in LM. Right, because he, he, he's a Mozambican. He's a Mozambican. So, so you went to uh, uh, Lorenzo Marx. Lorenzo Marx. Lorenzo Marx. I don't know Maputo. No. It and wasn't Maputo in those no, days. Lorenzo Marx. We'll get on to that in a minute. You then joined LM Radio, but, but not as an announcer, first of all. No. When I uh, went to live in Mozambique, that was in 1950, I, um, I went to the Radio Club de Mozambique. That is the Portuguese uh, broadcasting service. And I went to apply for a job there in the office. I mean, I never, ever thought that I'd be an announcer. So um, when I applied for the job, they said, well, you're just in time because we need someone to compile the programs. Because, you know, most of the programs for LM Radio were request programs. And so I started there as a compiler. Right, so you're basically marrying requests with songs. That's right. How did and you get... preparing the programs for to go into the studio. How did you get to become to be an announcer? Um, at the time, David Davies was there. He was the manager. And uh, when he discovered that I could speak of recounts, he um, said to me, well, uh, I think we should use you, you know, on the programs because uh, people used to write in Afrikaans, uh, they used to write Afrikaans letters, and most of the announcers that were there at the time couldn't speak Afrikaans. So um, I started translating the messages, mm -hmm. and he said, no, but this is silly, why translate? I mean, let's use you and you can go on the air. Of course, I was petrified, I didn't want to go, and I said, no, 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 I can never do that. And he said, come along. So I went for my first audition, and he said, well, it's not too bad, but you, you can do better. So go home, lock yourself in your bedroom, talk to yourself, do what you <laughs> like, and come back and do a second audition. I did that, and um, I did the second audition. He said, well, it's much better, but there's still room for improvement. Then I didn't get as far as doing the third audition because um, uh, there was an announcer there. Her name is Valerie Mayer. She's now living in London. Uh, she, went to, uh, she used to present the Housewives program. It was Housewives Choice. And uh, she was in hospital that morning. And as I came to work, David said to me, you're on the air at 10 o'clock. I said, what are you talking about? He said, well, Valerie is ill. She's in hospital, and you have to do the program. So I said, well, I can't. It's impossible. <laughs> he said, you just have to do it. And I went in, and I presented the program. He was very satisfied. It was bilingual. And um, from then, I just went on. Been announcing ever since. And you, you've done, I believe, almost everybody, you did almost every program for LM, apart from the... the yes. The Hit Parade, I believe that's it was called right. in those I, days. I presented every single program that was on any radio except for one, and that was the Hit Parade. Mm. Um, now, it was I, always done by David Davies, or if he, if he was not there, by someone else, a man, because they felt it wasn't sort of a program for a female. Right. Not like today. <laughs> yeah, but a lot of people still say it's not a program for female today. It's strange, you still don't get many female presenters on radio. Do you in Australia? Uh, no, not a lot. Uh, we, we're managing to break through. Like radio Sheila. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of women on the, on the television. Then. Yeah. Enormous. It's yeah. very strong on television. Well, typical male chauvinist pigs, really. They're lovely to look at, but not to listen to. <laughs> <They're> good, <laughs> journal, good journalists, too, mate. No, no. Now, Evie, so, so th there you were now on LM, broadcasting to South Africa. That's right. And enjoying every minute of it. Every minute of it. And then your life changed dr drastically. September 1974. 74, yeah. Well, that was a very, very sad thing that happened, Kevin, because, and very unfortunate, too. 
I mean, we knew that the terrorists were there, that they were coming, but we never, ever, ever thought it would happen so suddenly. It really happened what overnight. Happen? Um, on the 7th of September, the uh, Portuguese government from Portugal and the Mozambican government and from Lima were to meet in Lusaka, mm -hmm. the Lusaka um, Accord, which we all thought was a peace uh, uh, treaty, whatever, mm -hmm. but it wasn't so. What actually happened that day in Lusaka... I believe your husband was there, wasn't Yes, he? I was going to tell you about that. Um, what actually happened there was that Portugal gave Mozambique away on a silver platter to Frem Lima. That's what happened. Mm. And it was, it was a terrible shock to everyone, and I was very worried because my husband was a pilot with a charter plane. He took, it, he took the um, reporters and the photographers up to Lusaka, and of course he was there with a the co-pilot. And um, Somebody phoned me and said to me, well, you know, your husband won't be coming back now because now they're going to, uh, uh, he's got to stay there because he's now a revolutionist and they, they're not going to let him come back into Mozambique, you see. So, of course, that, I was so worried about that. I was up the whole night. I was wondering what's going to happen. And I had to collect him the next day at about 3 o'clock at the airport because they were coming back. Mm. In the meantime, lots of things were happening at the, at the, uh, at the uh, radio station. And uh, a friend phoned me also a pilot, and he said, please do not leave home and do not come to the airport because they're stoning all the cars and they're setting them alight and we will get your husband home. So I said, well, is he coming? So they said, yes, he, he's on his way. We've had word from him already from Beira. So he managed and to leave Lusaka? Yeah. yeah. Yes, he did. He did. And uh, it's a long story, but uh, he did manage to leave and arrived safely. And he arrived home at about 7 o'clock that evening in a jeep with about four um, military police with him and all that, you know, protecting him, bringing mm. him home. What was happening at the radio station at this well, time? Um, well, the, uh, the rebels, the um, um, Renamo, I think it is, yeah, you know, person forgets, <laughs> but they took over the radio club, which we, you know, it's Radio Club de Mozambique. Of course, Elim Radio was in that same building. Mm -hmm. And... Um, they t there was announcements on the radio and everybody was going mad and screaming and, and not knowing what's happening. It was so confusing because then the Portuguese uh, uh, army was there, then it was for Lima, and eventually you didn't know who was actually taking over. Mm. And um, well, You were still broadcasting at the time? Uh, yes, the broadcast was going on. We had to continue and uh, I went back to work on the... Uh, well, I went to work on the Sunday and on the Monday and then on the 10th, <coughs> pardon me, that was on the Tuesday, that was the last day that I set foot in that building because I was doing my show. On the Monday, Jerry Wilmot, who was manager there at, th at that time, he said to me, look, when you're announcing, um, they will come up to you and ask to go on mic. Don't say anything, just give them the mic and let them say what they want mm -hmm. and just continue the program. Did that happen? That did, yes, they came in. <laughs> And uh, the guy with machine guns, I tell you, they were parading up and down in front of the uh, studio. Now, we had uh, glass doors, um, glass windows, shall I say, mm -hmm. in the door. And um, they were parading up and down there. I was so nervous, I, I could hardly <laughs> talk. Anyway, so the one man comes in, the record's playing, and, and he says uh, he wants to go on mic. So instead of me just fading out and giving mic, I still said him very nicely, do you want now or do you want to wait till the record's finished? He said, now. <laughs> so I just turned it down and gave him the, the mic. And, of course, he was telling everybody what had happened and what they're doing, and they've now taken over and mm -hmm. uh, uh, to South Africa, of course, because we broadcast in South Africa. Anyway, so the Tuesday when I went to work, um, around about 10 o'clock, uh, now, my husband was back. He was working at the airport, and he took a little radio with to listen to see what's going on. And the Tuesday morning, uh, I was on the air, and at about 10 o'clock, Jerry Wilmot comes running into the studio. He said, grab your bag and run home as fast as you can. Just go. And only the secretary was there because nobody had gone back to work since that mm. happened on the Saturday. And um, so I just grabbed my bag and, I, and I, I called Teresa, and that's my friend that was working there. And we ran down the stairs. We wouldn't get into the lift because we were on the second floor. And we ran down the stairs. And as we were running down the stairs, we don't know who they were, whether they were the rebels or the Fred Limo or, uh, or, whoever, or, the, yeah. or whoever they were. But they were all coming up the stairs. And we, I heard them say in Portuguese, hurry, 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 because they're coming through the, uh, the park across the road. And I said to Teresa, what are we going to do? Where are we going to go? She said, just don't stop. Just keep running, keep running. And she was about five or six blocks away. Uh, she lived five or six blocks away from uh, the radio club building. 
And we just ran all the way. And we just collapsed when we reached her home. In the meantime, my husband's listening to the radio. He hears <laughs> me disappear off the air and heard Jerry Wilmot talking. So, of course, he gets into his car and he rushes off to the, to the radio club and he, he wants to go in. They won't allow him to go in, of course. And so he said, but I have to get in. I've got to look for my wife. So someone in there knew him and uh, said, OK, come along, let's go and look for her. So he went up to the studio, found Jerry Wilmot there. So he said, where's my wife? So he said, she's gone home. So, of course, she's gone home with Teresa. So he went home. I wasn't home. So then he dashed to Teresa's house and found me there. Well, we were all as white as can be. I can imagine. And um, it was terrible. It was really very, very bad. You, the shooting going on in the streets and everything. It you eventually managed to get out of, of yes. L.A. there. This happened on the 7th, and then we, um, on the radio, they kept uh, warning people. Uh, you see, we lived in Soma Shield, which was the new suburb, and it had these new houses with the big glass uh, uh, windows the, and that. This the posh end of town. <laughs> <laughs> well, and uh, they were telling us, uh, whoever was living in Soma Shield, to get out, because they were coming to attack us, you see. So... We dashed off to a cousin of mine who lives on the, who lived on the seventh floor of a very tall building, and we went in there, and we we grabbed everything we had in the fridge and just took off and went to her place, mm. and we stayed there till the seventeenth, and then we managed to come up. Right. Uh, my husband came in his car, I came in mine. We drove up and um, we left uh, someone there to pack our our uh, furniture. We got our furniture out and uh, our cars. And it must it. have been such a relief when you crossed the border. Yes, I cried bitterly. <coughs> we lost two houses in, in Mozambique, one big home and the one across the bay, um, a little uh, sort of holiday cottage. Mm. And, and the irony of the situation, I believe, uh, Evie, is that then, a few months later, you went to join the SABC and you had to do something rather drastic before they allowed you to which was resigned from LM Radio. Yes, well, you see, when I... When I yes. <laughs> Can you believe it? But you see, that is... Um, because when I applied for the uh, job, for the position in Lorenzo Marx, it was at, with the Portuguese, Radio Club de Mozambique. You see, it wasn't LM Radio. Uh, so I, I was actually working for Radio Club de Mozambique. So you had to resign and from so them. And so I had to resign from them because of pension and all this. And I had to res resign and then reapply here for a job. And I got it eventually. Mr. Siebert got me the job on Springbok Radio. And then came Radio Highfield. Uh, yes. Mm. I was very, very happy. Yeah. On Super. We'll, we'll talk some more in a moment. And uh, we'll be back with some uh, more Late Night Live. Ladies and gentlemen, Evie Martin. <laughs> when we're out of the classroom, I've got to take special care of the kids. One minute I'm one of the gang, and the next I'm a guardian angel. But I'm always a friend. And I've always got to be in control. There isn't time for a headache. I had one a while ago, but a grandpa headache powder soon put me right. Grandpa's famous triple action formula is in fine powder form. So it works quickly to bring fast, effective relief. Ah, grandpa. And now, win a home worth 100,000 rand with Eno and grandpa. Win! That's right! With the Beachies Mega Music Mag. Mega stars in your box of Beachies. Collect them, swap them, share them, and win! Over a hundred thousand rands worth of prizes have got to be won. Are you? Get your Mega Music Mag with Mega stars in the Beachies. Pack Cher, Madonna, Whitney, Terence Trent, the Pet Shop Boys, Aha, and Prince. The Mega Music Magazine competition from Beachies. But then to share! Beachies is the thing to share! Beachies! Now, Evie, when you came back from Mozambique, it was at the time that TV was starting here. That's right. And at Bala era. Did you never want to go into TV? No, I, I didn't really want to because I feel that if you go on TV, you have to be trained from the beginning uh, to be a TV announcer because... That's where I'm going wrong. <laughs> I feel that if you've been used to radio for so many years, it is very, very difficult to go on TV because... I mean, on TV, you have to sort of concentrate just looking straight ahead of you. If you're in the studio, the microphone is there. You can turn around and talk and do anything and stand on your head. It still doesn't matter because nobody can see you. Um, although when I arrived here, I got a call from someone at TV asking me to come along for an audition for a continuity. I came through and I did the audition and they phoned me back to say it was fine and gave me two dates that I would be on. It was in December, I remember. 
And uh, but at the time I was working for Springbok Radio, and um, our boss has passed away now. Uh, he was very, very much against TV, and he would not let me go. Why was he against TV? I don't did, know. He did, just, did you never ask him? No, he was just, he said it's evil. He didn't like TV. <laughs> 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 but it's true, he, he, he wouldn't let me go. So, of course, time went by, and I became a little older. So, uh, I just dropped the whole thing. But you never tried again? No. 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 How evil is TV in Australia? <laughs> well, it's very time-consuming, and I think it... Uh, it's broken up a lot of family life. Uh, it goes all day and all night. It doesn't stop. Um, and it's, you have to ration the television out for the children. And uh, otherwise, it uh, touch, takes over completely. Mm. And the soaps, so many people are addicted to the soaps. In the middle of the day, they just run one after the other. Yeah. And I, I watched them the other day. I watched them and I could see how the people get addicted to them. Mm just to see the format. One, one, one of the soaps that we've got on here, uh, which I won't mention because I can't remember what it's called now, actually. <laughs> but I, I remember watching it about four months ago, and then I haven't watched it since, and I watched it about two days ago, and nothing's changed. That's right. It's just the same. Mm. And I, I don't know, why do people get addicted to them? Do you watch a lot of television? I never watch television, Kevin, because I'm basically busy with shows every night. And uh, I'm very seldom at home in Cape Town. I'm blessed uh, by being There's that word blessed <laughs> oh, <sorry>. by being <laughs> in Cape Town. Oh, Kevin. <laughs> Next. <laughs> tell me, tell me truthfully. I mean, he is the the big name in Ooh. Bless Bridges in in this country, middle of, middle of the road music. Bless Bridges is the main man or the main manner. What what do you think of him? Uh, let me be very candid and very straightforward. I, I don't really think, you know, there is, there is a place for every single person in South Africa. And uh, I feel married, there is... Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, therefore, some people might like his music, and I'm very happy for it. Some people might like my music. Some people might enjoy, you know, rock and roll. I, I love Roland, you know, and just now, and he's got this incredible... We, we call it in, 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 in the Latin languages, simpatico, the simpatico... Uh, feeling as he s sits the, on the piano. The aura. Before, why should one genre of music, you know, uh, rise to, to its peak at the expense of the other? You know, t I don't have a problem, really. I don't have a problem whatsoever. I love music, and you must remember when I arrived here in South Africa, I never sang as a child. Right. I never knew what music was all, was all about. And I fell in love with this incredible, you know, uh, art form so much that I, 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 I decided to make, uh, you know, my career and exchange my first uh, degree for music. Somebody said the other day, you exchanged the pulpit for the stage, which wasn't quite very nice. Why, why the pulpit? Well, because I was trained as a young minister, first of all. Can oh, you believe it? Oh, really? So you went, you went from <laughs> the pulpit in, into music? Yes. Is it, is it very strange? Not really, because no. it, it, doesn't music change? I mean, doesn't music have a message anyway? Doesn't music yes, it does indeed. make people change? Can't people, Tony, don't, don't you think people can relate to music? Oh, I yes. think so, yeah. I think, the, you know, uh, songs from people like Bob Dylan, on that side of the music um, spectrum, people like him had a big influence in the 60s, I think, and still today, probably, on people. John Lennon, um, mm. poetry to music, whatever you want to call it, but they do certainly get a, a message across in their songs. Yeah. But isn't this the, the tragedy today that uh, we, the artists, want to get on with, with this universal message of love to everybody, and we, get, we just get bugged by everybody, you know? It, it's, it's so unfair today that artists in South Africa uh, can no longer, well, certain, a certain segment of, 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 of the artist can go and make a success overseas, but otherwise we can't. To me, that's a tragedy mm. because definitely music transcends all sorts of, of barriers as mm. far as I'm concerned. Mm. It does seem to me a lot of people I speak to on the show tend to feel that they have to go overseas to actually, ah, oh, now I've made it, I've made it overseas. What's wrong with making it here? Nothing. Nothing. I, I think, to a certain degree, South Africans have this incredible inferiority complex that whatever we produce here is not good enough in terms of overseas. I mean, nonsense. We, we've produced some of the greatest names in any field, whether it's, whether it might be on sport, on the sport field, or, or in, in terms of, 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 of the artistic field. We, we have produced them. You know, what, what do you think, Roland? Same in Australia. Exactly the same in Australia. Everybody feels they've got to go over to make it. Once they make it overseas, Nobody in Australia wants to know, because I know the, the tall poppy <laughs> syndrome again, yeah. <laughs> like Kylie Minogue, yeah. one of the biggest names in the world. Kevin, if I can say the, something... There's, there's, there's some, some great music coming out of Australia, though, isn't there? Oh, the Black Sorrows, and, uh, Jimmy Barnes. 
Yeah. Midnight Oil. Great band. In Excess. Great band. Johnny Farnham. Yeah. <laughs> Can name a lot of them, actually. Yeah. Now, Tony, you're, you're also a foreigner. Mm. Here you are in South Africa. What, what is it you want to do here? I'd like to get involved. You talked uh, about just now about making it here. There's nothing wrong with making it here, I think, Kevin. I think it's a good place to make it in this business, in, in, in any, any industry, really. You know, I think more foreign people should come here. Uh, the climate's great, you know, the environment, the, the, the lifestyle is terrific. Um, unfortunately, overseas, uh, the pictures they have over there are slightly different. Uh, slightly tainted, aren't they, I'd distorted, say. Distorted, yeah. Um, but for me here, yeah, then, I intend to stay and... Uh, television, I think. Yeah. Now, you've been trying to make a few TV programs, haven't you? Yeah, we, Is it yeah. true, I mean, somebody told me <laughs> not long ago, that you were actually seen flying a jumbo jet? Yes. Yes. Uh, well, recently I put together a program that's to do with the, the launch of a, uh, a new shopping complex. And uh, the, the launch was staged on a, a jumbo jet in the air. And maybe other people were on, I don't know. And it flew to Durban and then to Bloemfontein and then back to Jan Smuts in Joburg. Um, and throughout this piece with the TV, I gave the impression that I, in fact, also was a jumbo jet pilot, and uh, I'd wow. be flying it later. So then I went to the, the simulator they have, uh, the operations building, Jan Smuts Airport, mm -hmm. and we shot uh, scenes of me flying the jumbo through the, the cockpit window of the simulator. So uh, you've got the entire instrumentation panel there, and the view, and me with the joystick, <laughs> you know, flying this thing, and uh, it works quite well. Did you crash it? Uh, for fun later, yeah, because you can with those things. It's only a computer. It's like a big video game, really. Yeah. What, what it's cost it? seven million dollars. But... Oh, it's, it's a nice video game. <laughs> yeah, nice. But you, you, I mean, you're into video games, aren't you? Like that kind of yeah, thing, like don't you? Yeah, like that kind of thing. Yeah. Gadgets, any any gadget, you know. What, what's your favourite gadget at the moment? Uh, let me tell you here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, yeah, yeah. Uh, I see what you mean, yeah. Uh, I, I like messing around with video, you know. <laughs> don't we all? <laughs> <laughs> got a camera no I, I like you know um, in this day and age there's equipment available for use in the home that you can make your own TV shows you can for fun you know home films as they used to be but that kind of gadgetry I like I like to mess around with sound mixing sound and and now you can buy these little keyboards you know and they digitize sound mm. so you can sample your own voice or any sound you know and then go up the entire scale they go you know, you can do the entire... gets back to the man, really, who advertises on the back of toilet doors. You know? <laughs> it does, rather. Yeah. <laughs> which, is, uh, <coughs> which is where we came in with you. It's yeah. pro probably a good place to leave you there as well. Okay. Tony Blewett, thank you very much. Thank Tony you, Blewett. Kevin. And I think that's about it for uh, Late Night Live for this week. Of course, we'll be back next week, very much the same time, after the movie. I don't know what the movie is next week, actually. But I'm sure I'll tell you during Saturday. But we're not quite finished because Manuel... No, not yet. Because oh. I'm not finished with you yet. Because you went from, from opera to kind of middle of the road. And we have Roland Storm with us, who is <laughs> heavily into rock and roll. How would you like to do some rock and roll? Me? Yes. No. Yes. Oh, yes, no. please. Oh. Come on. Come on. <laughs> come on. <laughs> Going 